Good evening to all. My name is Jay, Jay Hurwitz. I'm from the Moffett Institute, and I am a, I, uh, I have the honor this evening of being the moderator of this session with Dr. Tracy Tokuhama Espinoza. That's quite a name. It's also quite a presentation. As you can see the title there, it's Neural Myths, Common False Beliefs About the Brain and Learning. And I encounter, I personally encounter a lot of myths about uh, learning. I don't know exactly about the brain. I'm not uh, well versed enough to, to know uh, what is a myth and what isn't. But about learning, I pretty much know something about myths and I encounter them often. But I'm glad that we have Tracy with us because she knows quite a bit more than I do about that. And we're looking forward to a very interesting evening. Um, we already have quite a number of us here. And I expect that some more will be joining us as we go along. We won't be saying hello to each person that comes in. We'll just be happy to have them join us. And we're looking forward. This is the first session of, the, uh, of this year's um, online webinars from the International Channel of the Moffett Institute. And uh, there will be more. But I'm very happy to get us off to a good start. Uh, as you can see, Tracy is a former member of the OECD expert panel on teachers' new pedagogical knowledge. That's a mouthful unto itself, but she's also a research, uh, researcher affiliated with the Faculty for Social Science Research in Quito, Ecuador. She is with us this evening from Ecuador, although she spends time also in North America. And uh, so she also teaches a course via Harvard. And you can see the name of it there. And I think that that's enough of my just going on and on. I simply will close my microphone and allow Tracy to open her hers and to tell us about what's happening. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jay, for that introduction. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's great to see some, uh, an old friend here, Dugalit, and some new friends here from all, our, all around the world. I'm really looking forward to this session. We have a lot uh, that we want to try to cover, so I'd like to launch into that, but just um, just very quickly for some people who might not be familiar with the online format, if you look into uh, on the left-hand side where you see your own name, you're able to raise your hand and there's also a chat box, and I really would hope that this is interactive. And there's nothing more boring than just sitting and listening to somebody else talk for, <laughs> for a long time, so I will be um, paying a lot of attention. Um, to Deborah, who says, yes, she's coming from Israel, and, and, I, and I, my biggest question was, I'm directing this towards teachers, um, and if there's anybody who's not a teacher, I see there's a doctor in here, if there's any other people, uh, so Sebastian said that he's a neuropsychologist, if there's other people that will try to um, address comments that are broad enough so that they fit into your professional field as well. So I hope that that works. Um, if anybody has things, and again, I'm going to be paying attention to the chat as best as I can, and uh, Jay's going to Help, uh, help keep me on target with that. So please, let's try to make this as interactive as possible so that it does uh, result in some kind of a change in your own professional um, execution uh, you know, tomorrow. So it's not just something that's theoretical, but something that's really real. We want to begin um, by looking moment, at Tracy, um, Tracy? a couple of different pieces. Tracy, of you, said, sure. you said there's a doctor uh -huh. and then you said execution. Yeah. I hope that they, we're not talking about something which is um, you're, you're, you're joining those two things together. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. No, I just see that there's Dr. Shoshana uh, Rosmarin who's here, and then I was I was mentioning that I didn't I wasn't 100% sure that everybody here was teachers, and I see that there are some people who are non-teachers, and I'm going to try to address all that. <laughs> I wanted to also um, let you know because there's always um, lots of uh, individual uh, interests and questions that sometimes we might not be able to reach or respond to everybody's individual uh, interests and needs today. So I'd like to invite you, um, I'm very open to have exchanges with people who are serious about incorporating uh, this new perspective of mind-brain education or neuroscience, uh, psychology, and pedagogy all together uh, into your own practice. So if you come up with some ideas or questions or doubts and do want to write to me, I'm very open to receiving emails from you um, uh, as we go along or, um, you know, forever, not just today or tomorrow, but, you know, throughout your own practice. So please feel free to uh, write that down and to stay in contact. What we're going to look at today, um, we're going to begin with a broader view of uh, education and why it's changed, thanks to neuroscience and technology. And then we want to get into the meat of things. What is the really high quality information that exists 
and what is the information that is really uh, tenuous. There's a lot of, uh, of things that come out in the popular press that we know are just not true. So we want to get away from those myths. And the thinking behind this is that it's very important, I'd say, number one, important is to get rid of the bad information. Uh, number two would be to adopt the correct attitudes, you know, towards what is our role as teachers, because these have changed quite a lot over the past decade. Um, and then, then to be able to apply different types of strategies or techniques or activities. Uh, and the problem is that in teaching, I often go to conferences and teachers just want, you know, give me the tools, tell me what to do next. And I really feel very strongly that the professional today in education really has to understand why certain things work and why certain things are good or bad. Not just uh, applying things, but actually um, looking at how they can best improve their practice using evidence from real science, okay? So this is what we're going to try to do uh, over the course of the next hour or so. And I'm going to start by highlighting a bunch of changes that have occurred over the past, um, I'd say, uh, we talk about 21st century skills, I'd say, yeah, it's about 17 years into this or 15 years into this, but we've been talking about some changes that now are actually very apparent all around the world. I have the, the luck to work with uh, schools, you know, throughout Asia, South America, Europe, and now this wonderful debut here with you. Um, and there's, this is something that's quite common all around the world. There are different expectations of schools, and these de different expectations of schools have emerged mainly because um, the majority of the world's population now has access to uh, basic education. Um, but what they don't have is access to equal quality. A lot of people, there's a very big variety, even within countries, of what is good or bad educational quality. So uh, here in Ecuador, we make a joke. They say, educación es de todos. Education is for all. Yeah, but, and I say, but it, doesn't, it shouldn't be for all if it's all bad quality. It has to be good quality, not just quantity, right? We've also changed the focus of educational goals from considering, um, which was very industrial model of, of teaching kids by math, language, arts, physical education, or whatever, separating um, different academic fields into these different silos. And now we see with this very bold move, for example, in Finland, of how they're going to get rid of uh, just looking at uh, academic um, subject areas and actually trying to help uh, kids view things as term in terms of um, problem-based learning, how to resolve an issue in society, or how do we resolve the, the trash pickup outside, or how do we resolve, you know, the water delivery or the need for food, or whatever it might be. How do we resolve problems using a variety of different tools? And we know that there's no problem that you can just answer with just one domain of expertise, not just through math or just through science, but we know we have to mix a lot of information about about history and art into all of our solutions. So we're moving away from silos into a more integrated interdisciplinary view of learning. Um, we're also uh, understanding now that we're not just here as teachers to get the kids to pass our classes. We are meant to be arming them with skills so that they can actually learn throughout the lifespan. Um, we're also looking at a move from not just using books, which you know we love, we love the smell and feel of them and touch of them, but there's a lot of other um, resources that are available to us um, pretty much for free that we can actually use to leverage technology in our classroom to actually complement lessons. So the change of resources is also huge. And then there's this other view that's very much um, something embraced by 21st century um, uh, discussions that has to do with uh, a move away from, yes, I'm here to improve my own learning, but when I do that, I improve my society or the community I live within. And in doing that, then I can improve my country. So there's this idea of education as sort of being a ticket and, 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 and of entrance into the knowledge society or, or moving in towards more innovation. And, and so it's not just for the individual, but we see that there's many, many goals that we're sharing in education now that have to do with people who are able to collaborate with one another or who are more creative in their approaches to things or who are culturally sensitive in the way they approach their classes. So these are some big changes that have happened in education. We also know that there's, based on those things, there's new expectations of both students and teachers. So instead of just passing a class, uh, we're looking for people who are, you know, critical and creative thinkers, who are autonomous in their learning, who don't need to be told what to do or how to think. And people who can work with heterogeneous groups, people who are different from them, um, and that they know how to leverage technology in the best way possible. They don't become slaves to it, but they're actually able to use it better. So if we're looking for that in the ultimate goal of uh, our teaching, so we want our students to come out like that, that means a lot 
for us because you cannot teach what you don't know, okay? So that means that we're going to actually have a lot of uh, reflection on how we, are individually, we need to look at these particular skills ourselves and say, where am I weak? What do I need to work on? If I'm trying to help shape this new 21st century learner, what are the skills that I, I am deficit in and that I need to improve upon? The third change has to do with technology and the information that we now have about the brain. Um, even just, and you can still find all of these pictures online like I did, they're, they're very easy to find, but starting around the 1990s, um, the decade in the brain in the United States invested a whole lot of money into actually improving what we know about the brain and how it actually works. So we've moved away from these early caricatures that talked about, you know, left brain thinkers and right brain thinkers, you know, you've got this terribly neat and organized uh, left brain, and then you've got this wacko, crazy, you know, free-for-all right brain person, right? Or that men's and women's brains are so drastically different, or that you have pink brains and blue brains, or that there's such a thing as a, as a three-layered brain, you know, you have a mammalian brain, or reptilian brain, sorry, mammalian brain, and you have higher, higher order thinkings. Or this idea that thinking is actually divided into these really neat compartments, or that we are only using 10% of our brain, or that teenagers are absolutely wacko uh, because they haven't matured enough. We know that there's some truth to this um, in measuring hormones, um, and this, uh, but this uh, rewiring of the brain systems throughout adolescence is actually shown to extend uh, far later than we actually thought, you know, and so we have these few longitudinal studies that are showing that your brain is always uh, re reconnecting and rewiring, especially when you're studying. Um, and then we have these things about having compartmentalized uh, learning. This isn't true. So most of these characteristics, this is um, this is uh, these character um, caricatures of the brain. If you see some of these, it's kind of your big signal, you know, red light, go run away, because these things are not really true. We started to improve uh, technology, and that actually gave us a better insight into the brain. We know that your brain works basically through chemical and and uh, and electrical changes and these networks that are formed uh, physiologically speaking, right? So you have to look at the physiology of the brain, but you also have to look at the chemistry as well as the electrical networks. And so we began to have better imaging of the brain and we used to, you know, measure uh, blood flow and, and see things through PET scans. And then we actually had 3D scanners, which gave us a better image. But nowadays, what is absolutely phenomenal, and those of you who are interested, I hope you get a chance to look at the Connectome project which is actually documenting real life healthy brains, not just damaged brains or brains that have had difficulties, and not just coming up with replicas or networks or models of how learning might occur, but we can actually see which parts of the brain get connected when somebody is doing a basic activity, a basic arithmetic problem, for example. So we now have the technology to be able to be a bit more um, bold in some of the things we say. We actually know these are typical networks of what's going on in the brain. This also confirms for us that we can never say, you know, this piece of your brain does whatever, or these right brain people are creative. When you look at creativity in the brain, you end up seeing all of these wild connections all over the place, left, right, hemisphere. You don't have anything that's just pocketed into a single area. So while we know that there are certain parts of the brain and typical physiology that we all share as humans, the actual networks um, are all over the place. So we know that there's no such thing as localizationism. So we know that technology has really changed how we view the brain and how, what we now know about learning. The fourth big change is what we know as to really what influences better student learning outcomes. And we know, we know this because we now have um, more longitudinal studies. So we can compare the same person uh, you know, who's now, you know, 6 to 10 to 14 to 16 to 18, we can actually see over the lifespan how they're actually changing, what their brain is doing, how it's actually been modified. We also have international comparative studies, which is really, really interesting. This is an area called um, uh, cultural neuroscience. It's actually trying to pull apart what are the things that are true for all brains all around the world, independent, you know, of culture, and then what are the things that are heavily um, burdened by, by cultural influences that are changed? Um, so does learning how to count in, in Japanese, for example, that, that is literally uh, adding and multiplying, like nijuichi is 10, is 2, 10, 1, means 21. What's the difference between a brain that thinks like that versus a brain that's just said, you know, told 21, right? So we know that there's international comparative studies that help us see when things are similar about all brains and then what things are actually different about different brains based on the cultural context and especially the influence of language. And then we have 
methodologically comparative skills. And this is actually thanks uh, in great part to uh, John Hattie, who actually helped us uh, compare uh, more than 50,000 studies of more than 2,400,000 students to see what really influences student learning outcomes. So based on these changes in education, now we have some great information that's helping us learn how we can teach better. But you and I know, all of us know, that the, the key to all of this is the quality of the teacher. And one of the biggest um, failings we have, I think, in teacher formation is that most teachers don't even understand their own prejudices or what they think about how intelligence develops or who has it or, or, or how can it be um, nurtured in our classroom. And these particular prejudices actually influence the way that the teacher interacts with the student. So we know that these things are, are actually really, really um, hurtful. And they can be positive or they can be hurtful in student learning. So I actually looked at what, um, what Hattie had said about teacher attitudes. And it comes down to this. You know that um, all learning competencies can be broken down into you know, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, right? And the thing that takes most long uh, to, to teach is actually uh, teachers' changes in attitudes, and even students, right? It's much easier to memorize a date or a fact or to learn even how to apply that particular formula or concept. But it's much harder to change uh, people's attitudes. So we know that teacher attitudes actually change learning outcomes. So the way a teacher treats a student based on their presumptions of what's going on in, inside that kid's brain actually change that student's possibility for learning. So what I want to challenge you on right now is to look at a list of 15 key attitudes uh, that are related to the brain and learning. And I'd like to just, you know, just personally, if you could put yourself on this scale um, between one through four, okay? Um, the, uh, it, if you don't believe in this, I, I highly disagree. Two, I highly agree, okay? I'm just going to read these out loud, and I'd like to see where you, you personally fall onto this scale. And so please um, think about this. And this is really what I hope that you take away as a personal reflection here. There's some things that you need to... Uh, get over or get more information about so that you get away from a certain you, prejudices Tracy, about a certain aspects. Tracy, do you want us to add these um, thoughts and then give you a uh, total number at the yes, end? Yes, sorry. Um, that could be good. Maybe if we can just, how about if we, um, just with a handful of them, just for time's sake, um, I'll tell you which ones we really need, and these are the ones that are most related to uh, the brain. The one that has to do with the development and human potential, if we could do those three, um, together um, and so we can tally them, that would be fabulous. But before that, let me just ask you to reflect. Um, we know that we're trying to cultivate people who know how to collaborate and work with other people. So one of these things about cultivating teamwork is one plus one is three. When we work together, we learn better. And we all contribute to individual and collective growth. So, you know, where do you fall on that? Do you agree with that highly or do you think that's actually um, something you totally disagree with? You know, I'd love to hear about that. A teacher's not paid to answer any more questions. A teacher's job is to get students to find their answers on their own and to develop their own questions. This is one of the hardest things. Teachers think that they have been paid to be a walking you know, encyclopedia and answer every single question. Um, the challenge to teachers now is, no, if you want kids to learn to think, then you don't answer any more questions. Uh, the third one has to do with evaluating um, a better culture of evaluation um, that we we enjoy being evaluated. I luckily grew up in Berkeley, California in the 60s, and I love being evaluated because I knew that anytime somebody told me that I had something wrong, it was to help me get better. There was no malice in it, right? So do we have this correct culture of evaluation? Differentiating, um, and this is the first part is true, the second part is the question. Almost everything we do, and this is according to Hattie's study, in the classroom helps learning outcomes, even if you just sit in the classroom for, for nine months, you're going to learn something, right? So here's the, the question now. Our job is to actually uh, determine what works best for most of the kids most of the time. We have to be much more selective in the way we teach or the tools that we use to teach. Uh, learning how to learn. The objective of modern education is to form lifelong lovers of learning, not just to pass the exam. To be a model. You can't get apples from a pear tree. So if I want all of these types of things, I have to actually already do that or be that because you can't teach something that you don't know. And then here's what I'd like to ask you if you could help me with this. 
Um, can you all, please, I'd like to get a, t a quick tally just to see what percentage of you agree or would say one, two, three, or four to these questions. The first one is differences in learning outcomes based on social economic status, that is, poor kids, are more related to the access to learning resources and to nutrition and to early stimulation. They are not in any way related to race. Do you agree with that? If you do, please say four. If you disagree with that, you can say one. Um, what, would you, what would you say? So the leads definitely, I totally agree with that, okay? We've got, Boaz also says the same, we have four, four, four. So we've got a lot of fours in here. That is really, really something that warms my heart. I'm very happy to hear that. We have, um, still today, it's unfortunate in Ecuador, we have a lot of teachers who will tell me, yeah, but the, the indigenous, the indigenous students, the Indians always do worse on um, standardized tests. And if you say, yeah, because they don't have any support in their native language, they don't have access to the best teachers. Nobody wants to go into the, to the rural areas where most of them live. This is the problem. It is not due to race, okay? So I'm glad that we mostly agree on that one. The next one, the brain cannot not learn. Learning is the brain's raison d'etre. It's, it's its reason for being. So everyone in my class can and will learn, though probably not, not all at the same pace. What do you guys think of that? One, two, three, or four. Do you agree? Or have some of you just come up against a brick wall and you think, no, there's some kids that just can't learn. You know, they can't learn my topic. Or do you think that uh, truly everybody can learn, although they will probably all learn in very different paces? What do you think of that? Four would be you agree, and one would be you disagree. Three would be somewhere in the middle there, two. Galit's got, she's big on the fours. There you go. <laughs> okay. Good. So, what do you think that, uh, can you, um, Boaz, if you could please, t can you just clarify why? You think that's not true. You think that many learning differences are based on, uh, oh no, sorry, that the brain, there, there are moments when the brain just doesn't learn. And if you believe that's true, why would you say that that's true? That's something that we need to reflect on, okay? Um, we know that it, it is, it's a survival mechanism. That's what your brain does. It has to learn, right? But so what the idea is that not everybody's going to be able to learn at the same pace is this caveat here is saying that, yes, everybody's going to get there, but they're not going to be able to get uh, enough. Okay, so this is wonderful. So not having personal contact, um, you're saying that if there's too many people in the class, it's very hard to reach all of those people in an individual way, which is why it's difficult to guarantee their learning. That's an excellent point. And we're going to talk about that in just a second, about how you manage or how groups actually influence um, and social contagion as well, how one person in the class can actually change the whole mood or learning environment of all the other students. Okay, three. Um, just, to, just to let you know, really quick parentheses, the average size of classes in Japan and Germany who tend to, you know, top out on some of these um, uh, scores in PISA Singapore is uh, 40 to 50. So they can have 40 kids in their class as well. So it's, it depends on what you're trying to get at, right? If you're trying to get them to pass this test or you're trying to get your real deep thinking skills, okay? The next one is vital to our talk today. Intelligence is fluid, not fixed. What do you guys think of that? In, intelligence is fluid. That means it's ever-changing. Uh, it's not fixed. It's not that you uh, hit a certain age and you can't learn anymore or that you, are, you inherit a certain type of gene and then you can't learn anymore. Um, but rather, it is fluid in that there is learning that can occur throughout the lifespan. Four, 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 four. It's also a matter of culture. Good, because that has to do with the previous point. You're absolutely right. How do we think, what do we think about intelligence being fluid? Are you all, I suppose you wouldn't be sitting here in a class <laughs> right now if you thought that you were past your prime and you couldn't learn anything and that, you know, intelligence was fixed. Most teachers tend to believe that, yes, it is, it is fluid. There is a problem, however, that we do, um, there is a strain. There are some people who actually go about saying, yes, you've hit a maximum age or there's a critical period for certain types of learning. And one thing I'd like to really put emphasis on, and this is a larger discussion for later if you like, there is nothing that is taught in an academic setting that has a critical period. There are sensitive periods, but there are no critical periods whatsoever. And so I hope that that's something we can continue to talk about a little bit later. 
The human spectrum of intelligence is broad. In a typical class, there'll be five to six percent of students with some type of learning problem, including dyslexia, dyscalculia, ADHD, Asperger's, as well as giftedness uh, on the other end of the spectrum. The question is, uh, are you responsible for all of them? Uh, we have a terrible tendency in many uh, schools in, in South America where if there's the slightest bit of a problem, they send the kid to the psicologo. They send them out, they say, you know, it's not for me to deal with. Uh, this is a very different uh, uh, mindset. It's that I'm not just there to teach the ones that are already there willing to learn. It is on me to be able to manage kids who might be outside of my, my bell curve of, of norm. Um, and to the extent, obviously not for uh, extreme forms of retardation or uh, autism spectrum disorder um, on the extreme, but for most kids, uh, including attention problems, which is pretty prevalent in a lot of countries, these are my responsibilities. Now, we've got a lot less enthusiasm here. We've got some twos and some ones and people saying, no, 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 send them out. <laughs> well, I always tell my teachers or my students who are becoming teachers that um, I don't measure their success by how well they do with the kids who are already doing okay, because they do okay without me. <laughs> I measure success by what you can do with those kids who are a little bit outside of that curve, who do need that extra help or that extra support. Um, and I will talk to a bit more about this when we get into some of the other myths, um, mainly because there's a big tendency now, wonderful Swedish model that talks about there's no such thing now as a special needs teacher. You know, all teachers are special needs, basically. Um, there are support rules for psychologists. So if a kid does have uh, dyslexia, so the teacher can recognize this and knows how to work with them within the class. And of course, they can have extra exercises outside of the class. But the idea is not to remove that kid from that classroom environment, OK? So let's let's talk about this because, OK, the Ministry of Education in Israel also degree, uh, disagrees. OK, I'll have to come and talk to you guys because this is a very big shift in um, being, becoming responsible uh, for all of the learners. Why is this? Because that's Society. Society is made up of five to six percent of people on one end of the spectrum which will actually have some difficulties. Uh, and then there's going to be another five to six percent who are actually just so brilliant that our class bores them. So how do we manage, how do we as teachers learn skills to be able to manage all of those people? Okay. Uh, the human brain, the organ of all learning, is not simple. Therefore, teaching, the teaching learning dynamic can't be simplistic. There are many books out there that are sort of like, you know, teaching for dummies kind of thing. And there's even certification programs that tell people they can te make them teachers in six weeks. Um, I really take issue with those things because it really shows a lack of understanding about the complexities of what's going on inside the brain. So uh, let's think about all, uh, all of these different things about whether, where we feel we fall on that particular spectrum. Um, I always draw parallels between educators and um, and doctors and physicians, I think that there's a lot of parallels here. We do a lot of diagnosis each day. We do a lot of uh, intervention. We do a lot of follow-up and evaluation. So I also believe we share the very first rule with medicine, which is do no harm. And unfortunately, because there are a lot of myths out there about the brain, there are many teachers who apply kind of silly techniques. Um, like they'll say, let's sit around in a circle and um, and, and pass around our candle because, you know, boys need to touch fire before they pay attention. I mean, that book sell, sold millions and people do that in their class, but it actually does harm because it actually uh, calls attention to things, for example, telling girls, you just don't have the right kind of a brain for, to be a scientist. Or you have, um, you know, you have a learning style that's not my learning style, which is why we don't connect, which is why you're not getting it. Those are all myths and those are all things that that do harm because they lower the potential of an individual student in your class. Uh, in terms of students learning outcomes, the teacher, not the family, has more influence. While the home is vital for good nutrition and responsible for levels of stress in early childhood, teachers have a greater influence over student learning outcomes and academic achievement. This is the one that many, many, many teachers have a hard time swallowing, that they have a very, very important role in influencing student learning outcomes. Uh, most teachers deflect and say, well, no, it's always, it's a home thing, you know. Had I been given, you know, better behaved kids or better genes or whatever, I'd have better kids in my classroom and I could do miracles. Well, actually, the truth of the matter is um, you probably spend more quality time focused on learning 
uh, than the parents do. And parents tend to also, you know, my kid is wonderful, perfect, always, or, or the opposite. But within the context of school, it is the teacher that has a greater influence on student learning outcomes. Um, and finally, uh, students uh, reach the level of expectations that teachers place on them. Uh, this means, as a result, that if I have mixed ability learners in my class, which we always do, the goal is to aim high. You should not aim low as the lowest common denominator or average, but kids will respond to what is expected of them. The last one is that I am the decisive factor in the class, okay? So these are some basic attitudes I just wanted to throw out for further reflection. It's not things that we're going to be able to go into tons and tons of depth on, but I just want to emphasize the key role of the teacher in having good uh, information and being able to be successful in this uh, 21st century context. In order to get um, a little bit more uh, uh, grasp on this, and I hope you all have something to write with, we know that, uh, does anybody know why, why you take notes? Why people should write? If you don't write, you will not remember. If you have no memory, you have no learning. So you need to write in order to help you <laughs> to have extended memory to be able to, to remember any of this, uh, you know, in 24 hours. So I'd like you to grab a piece of paper, and I would like you to just quickly jot down, we have literally 60 seconds, um, what is something you know about best practice teaching in the 21st century? Maybe you knew this beforehand, or it's something we've just talked about. And what is something that's just nagging on you right now? It's like, well, this was said, but I don't agree with this, or something needs clarification. Can you please write that down? Typing is also good, Billy. Just get some ideas on paper, at least one thing you know and one thing you'd like to know about teaching in the 21st century, and then we're going to move on. Take 60 seconds to do this, please. This is only for yourself, but it's to keep as a point of reflection, because uh, when we get to the bottom, to the end, I'm going to ask you to call back on these papers, OK? So just take a quick minute to do that. And I'm going to stop this for one second. Nothing's going to happen. It's just I'll take care of some things in the background. Okay. Okay, does everybody have at least one thing on each side? Something you know and something you'd like to know. Okay, we're going to move on now, and I want to just uh, put this into the last, uh, last commentary about um, the context of teachers. Unfortunately, I, while I believe that teachers are the most important um, uh, profession in society, sorry to my doctor friends out there, but while I believe that teachers are the most important uh, profession, we don't do a very good job of professional development. Um, we have people who become teachers, and then they, they can spend a couple of years being novices and advanced, and then become proficient and excellent, and you might end up being a master teacher at the end of your day. Um, but it's by experience, and we don't have a formalized structure of, um, of deepening our knowledge about certain areas. So what I'd like to suggest is that we have to rethink the way we go about doing it. And obviously, those of you in the classroom are uh, thinking about this because you are trying to um, add on to what your uh, past professional knowledge. Okay, so what who, what, when, where, how do, does uh, this type of thinking occur in 21st century skills in, in schools? We know that the who is very different. Remember, we talked about the school, parents, home, teachers, students, the administration of a school, the curriculum you have in teaching. What Hattie's research found, which was phenomenal, is that if we asked all of these actors, if you asked parents, if you asked teachers, if you asked administrators, um, about these things, um, the parents, the teacher, sorry, the parents and the administrators uh, coincided in their answers, and the teachers did not. Uh, but what the research is showing is that the individual student, if the student believes he is a learner, I can learn, I will learn, then that is the number one most important factor influencing student learning outcomes. But if a student, now this is the key part though, who makes the student feel that he's a learner or not? It's the teacher. It is not the parents. It's the teacher that will make the kid feel like he's empowered. Yes, I can learn. So the big problems come in here is when um, if a kid thinks the teacher thinks he's not going to do well, the kid doesn't even try. 
And this is independent of whether or not that's true or not, whether or not the teacher did think this or not, right? So the messages that we send to our students, do they uh, believe in us? Do, they, do we believe in them? Do they feel that we, at a minimum, believe that they will be able to learn, that they will all have the capability of learning, to learn, even though they're going to have different potentials in my subject area or whatever I'm doing, but they will all be able to learn is key, okay? If anybody has a question about these, this particular ranking, um, please do send me an email afterwards and we can talk about this in more depth afterwards. What are the types of skills? We did talk about this. It's not only subject area skills that we need to learn. It's not just, you know, Hebrew or Spanish or English or math or science or art, but we're trying to get people who actually can pose uh, greater questioning and, and be more innovative throughout the lifespan. And so this is a very different kind of a learner than, uh, than we've had in the past. Um, the type of teaching, what do we have to teach? It's, uh, I'd like to ask you, do you think it's more important um, what we teach or how we teach? If our goal is to get kids to learn how to think better, does it really matter um, our curriculum um, design? And if you recall in this last slide, we realize that the curriculum is actually the least, one of the least important factors influencing student learning outcomes, okay? Um, we have to, there are some different filters that we can talk about at the very end that have to do with um, questioning um, or ordering um, the presentation of materials in different ways. But all of these things are influential in teaching, but it's mainly how we teach. Do we have a didactic method? Do we have a questioning method? Is there time for reflection on the part of the students? Or is it just a, a bombarding of a lot of information? Um, how many of you know Rip Van Winkle? Ever heard of him? He's a fellow who fell asleep, uh, and he went to sleep for 100 years. And when he woke up, he found that transportation had changed. He found that banks had changed, that the way we tweet people in and out of government changed. Uh, our supermarkets look different. But our schools, our schools, um, which one of these is in 1910 and which one of these is in 2010? Sadly enough, they were both in 2010. One is Michigan, one is Illinois. I know that your schools don't necessarily look like this, but the idea is that we have to really leapfrog in, in changes. We have to catch up with other social institutions and society. So this has a lot to do with where learning is taking place now. Um, we know that there's a lot of information that's just free, so schools don't necessarily have to spend so much time te teaching dates, facts, formulas, but they actually have to think a little bit more about the dynamics of higher order thinking. Uh, we know that, you know, we can physically change our classes, but there's also access to a lot more information in, in the technology logical world that we're living in. Why do we need to change? We know that this is a very old graph from 2006, and this actually has, the curve has actually gone up even more for creative. But we've gone from being agrarian societies moving through industrial revolution to now moving on to the society that's based on, on knowledge, you know, how we build up knowledge and learning. And so, and we also know that that's where, where the money is, you know, so being creative in your response to things is not going to come from schools that actually only do, you know, multiple choice tests or, or that test um, traditional subject areas, but whether we need people who can combine information and look at things in a very different way. So how should the teachers be changed? This comes from the study that we did with the OECD panel, which said we have to move away from the old, you know, education styles to learning sciences. And this means that we have to mix and learn, nurture our craft as teachers from neuroscience. We need to have the information that's uh, embedded in how the brain learns and in psychology. You know, we have to learn from these other fields in order to respond to these questions in a better way. This is what my research has been on since I did my doctorate and the books I've written. And the last was the OECD's recommendation to the member countries of teachers' new pedagogical knowledge based on technology and on, on the neuroscience. So for more, if you care about that particular historical field, please um, take the time to look at this, um, this video, which has a, a long explanation of where did mind brain education come from. So this is the premise here. Designing educational experiences without an understanding of the brain is like trying to design a glove without understanding the hand. So the big question is, do teachers know enough about the brain? I would like you to ask, I'm going to ask you again now, at least one thing, and this I do want you to share. What is one thing you know about the brain and learning, and one thing you wish you knew, or that you're dying to know, or you think it would improve your practice if you did know? Please do um, type in here. So one thing, I know that 
the brain, the brain has two hemispheres. Okay, that's great. I want to know how to uh, enhance uh, my student's ability to, to memorize or whatever. That could be an example, okay? So please think of one thing you know and one thing you want to know and jot that down immediately. So nobody knows anything, or nobody wants to know anything. Help me out, Sebastian. What's something you know, and something that you still think you want to know, or something you think teachers should know, that they don't know yet? I want to know if affective filter can affect how the brain learns in all what ways. Excellent, Evelyn. We know that you cannot separate uh, emotional processing from decision making, and decision making is related to learning. So they are definitely, definitely connected. And in fact, and physiologically speaking, all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience, and the first check on that is at an emotional level. So we know that there's a huge area now called cognitive or affective neuroscience. A wonderful new book is coming out by Mary Helen Imordino Yang, which I highly recommend which uh, talks about the great link between affective learning and cognitive development and cognitive learning. Uh, the brain in women is different than men. Uh, you know that or you think that or you want to clarify this? <laughs> there are only five uh, small areas that have been documented that are different between men and women's brains. Women have a generally larger corpus callosum. Men have a generally larger right uh, amygdala. There's a few things that are, are noted as being different. The only, um, there, and there's just about no uh, study that correlates these physiological differences to behavior patterns. There's a ton of literature on hormones and how hormones do change uh, learning patterns, and that, those definitely are um, in different uh, balances in men and women. We have the same hormones, but we have different uh, proportions of them, so yes, there's a lot there. But there is research being done by some um, related to uh, spatial orientation in small children. There is a, a little bit of evidence there that there might be a different um, use of different uh, networks to call upon for uh, rehearsed facts about forms. But aside from that, there isn't any other difference. So it would be really shameful to say to a little girl, for example, you know, you just don't have a head for math or something like that because that's just not true. Or to tell a boy, oh, it's too bad you're not good at languages like the girls are. You know, that would be doing harm because that's just not true. Okay, ooh, there's a long one here and I'm not, I'm missing this. Um, the relationship between brain capacity and hormones. Uh, can you clarify that, Iris, a little bit more? So, Sebastian, I want to know how the specific learning methods affect learning process in low-income children. Um, Sebastian, there's some really wonderful literature talking about what are the strongest, the, the short answer to your question is that everything that helps anybody always helps kids from lower social economic backgrounds more. For example, Lauren Petito's work looking at how early biliteracy skills um, improves a child's own understanding of their first as well as second language and actually ameliorates the um, effects of poverty. So introducing a poor child who only knows English to Spanish uh, when he's eight years old and doing biliteracy skills is actually shown to make such changes in the brain and increase executive functions which are enhanced by bilingualism um, that to the extent that she says this ameliorates the effects of poverty. So all interventions will always be always good for low-income kids. If you want to talk about specifics, I'll give you a lot more um, concrete examples, especially related to executive functions, which is um, working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility. There's a lot of research being done on that right now. Um, I want to know the reasons to I'm aware that the brain is flexible and able to the life, and my question is, how to best teach adults? Excellent, okay. So Billy wants to know, um, is there a great difference? We know that there's plasticity throughout the lifespan. So in, in what way then should our methodologies change with the adult uh, learning brain? And this is a huge point um, because we know that adults have a wealth of experience. Remember I said that one of these dictums in, in mind brain education science is that, that all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience which means that if you have lots of prior experience, you have a lot to call upon. And one of the big differences with teaching adults versus kids is to actually know what they already know. So for example, in this particular activity, I'm looking at a bunch of adults who know a lot 
about the brain and they have some very sophisticated questions about the things that they want to know. So they don't need to know the basic things, but they're actually looking at how to improve their techniques in teaching. Um, there are some specific examples that we're going to give you as an optional homework um, at the very end, which will give some very concrete ideas of things that you could actually apply. Um, and I can also send you um, some bibliography, some information about slight differences between adult brains and then certain techniques that can be used at any age level. Um, I want you now to be in the class of 21st century. My class looks like the pictures. <laughs> oh, no. So Wallace has a classroom that looks like the ones that we had in the pictures here. Um, Here's the, here's the wonderful, the happy news is that uh, it doesn't matter what your class looks like. You can be drawing pictures in the sand if you want and be a great teacher. Uh, we know that, of course, things are facilitated when you have wonderful resources, but it doesn't mean that you have to have excellent resources. The quality of the teacher of you is the most important thing that's out there. So it's very hard to, to, to you know, leapfrog in this way, but if you apply some of these 21st century techniques related to the brain, you've already done um, a great service to your students independent of the kind of desks that they, that they have. Um, um, Deborah, what kind of disabled? When you say disabled people, how do they learn? It really depends. For example, if you if we talk about dyslexia, Dyslexia is a, is a disruption of a normal route that your brain takes to get information into, uh, into certain circuits. And if that circuit is um, blocked, then you have to rely on plasticity to retrain the brain to get the same type of information through a different circuit. So there's typical natural circuits that would be easier to travel, but um, most people, all people, have to learn through and would normally follow these, um, these typical pathways. But if that pathway is, is blocked, then you have to find a new way to do that. And that's why it takes a little bit longer, it takes different types of techniques uh, to reach uh, those individual people. Do hormones motivate certain types of learning? No, they motivate certain types of behavior, um, not necessarily certain types of learning. Is there a difference between the brains of babies? Uh, babies okay. All, uh, here's, this is a wonderful, um, Ophir, this is a big question of, of the nature versus nurture, right? Are we all born identical? No. We are born with the genes that we inherit from our parents, which can be potentiated to fulfill certain things. So not everybody is born equal. Um, you, you get some good genes or you get some bad genes or whatever. However, having said that, um, there's a huge stock in the experiences you have throughout your life. So if you have the right kinds of experiences to potentiate your genes, then you're able to actually do things. Um, so uh, having said that, there's a, there's a great exception that has to do with um, your first language. So all, you know, all normal brains, all people that are born without any type of disability, yes, have the potential to learn all languages, you know, from the get-go. But having said that, now, do you have stimulation? You, we know that there's some kids who look like they're retarded in their language growth, but it's because nobody's ever talked to them. So we know that um, there's, there's differences there. Uh, Glee, thanks. OK, James, not bringing you. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on. Um, these are some good things. So we're going to talk about all of the things that you guys brought up, and we're going to try to get, um, is behavior one of our of learning? Behavior, a sub-element of behavior, human behavior, is to learn. Just like a sub, a behavior is to sleep, uh, or eating patterns, or the way people react to a funny joke. All of those are behaviors, and anything that's a behavior can be learned, can be learned, okay? So just to, just to throw that in there um, for, for Iris, okay? And executive functions and liter literacy acquisition. Okay, so Sebastian, we'll talk about executive functions and literacy acquisition. If not in this particular forum, I will send you a whole lot of information because that's an area that I've been actually researching a new book on. Okay, so in general, can you guys just give me a thumbs up, thumbs down? Do you think the average teacher in your context actually knows a lot about the brain or knows the things that you know or knows at least the basics about the brain? No, 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 no. Okay. This is really scary, right? Because the brain is the organ of all learning, right? So going back to the, the, the metaphor of the glove, if you don't know about the brain, how can you possibly do the job teaching and tailoring your lessons to that brain? One of the big problems here is that in education, we're, look, we're used to looking at methodologies or developmental practices or how to plan or how to evaluate. Whereas in, in neuroscience, they're looking at the level of the brain or how synapses function or, or neurotransmitters or the chemicals of the brain. 
So they look at different types of things, and psychologists are looking at, you know, the role of emotions or, or, or group behavior or perception. So they're all, they're kind of different fields. The idea is that those of you daring to sort of move into this field will have to get into a comfort zone, which is actually joining all of these different areas, which is a very distinct formation that we've had in the past. So this means that a mind brain education scientist can be a teacher, it can be a psychologist, it can be a neuroscientist, but it's managing, it's somebody who manages the discussion in this intersecting field. And I have to tell you, this is a booming and growing field of education. Um, there are new programs all over the world. Harvard has a new PhD program in this. There's a, a lot of programs that are growing out of this because we realize that you cannot answer a lot of the questions about um, how kids learn. We know a lot about how people learn, but we haven't talked about how we should teach in order to take advantage of that. So the idea is that we have to now use, um, oops, I'm sorry, we have to use different tools. We have to add information from neuroscience and psychology to better our practice. So this means taking this mind brain education field, the information that we have from, say, Hattie's work on what really influences student learning outcomes, and think about this in a developmental trajectory. You know, how, where am I at in, as being a teacher, and what can I add to my practice to become even better? So now we're going to get into the meat of uh, the whole um, the whole brain stuff here. There's things that we believe about the brains, and there's things that are just myths. And from that, we actually get information that are universals. There's only a handful of them, but things that are true for all brains. And then there are things that are called tenants. These are things that are, so the principles are things that are true for everybody, and tenants are things that are true, but they have huge human variants. For example, how many of you think that uh, sleep is important for learning? Is it important to sleep to learn? Yes, no? Yes, 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 so all, say all these tired people, yes, 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 of course, <laughs> okay. So we know that sleep is really vital to learning. In fact, sleep is good to help us rest and be able to pay attention. And then we have uh, memory, uh, which is enhanced by memory consolidation through dreaming. So we know that sleep and dreaming, which are two different things, are both necessary for learning. But I can't dictate to you how much you should sleep. Anywhere between four and a half and 12 hours is normal, according to the research at, at Harvard by Hobson. At eight is an average. But it's, so we know that tenants are things that are vital to learning, but you cannot say, you know, do it this way or one way or another because there's a huge human variance, okay? So once we know these things, this actually tells us how we should actually teach to take advantage of this. So what we're going to do is play a quick little game about what we know to actually pull out the myths here. And this comes from a categorization scheme that was built up by the OECD into four categories of information. There's information that is well established. Yes, there is plasticity throughout the lifespan, okay? Then there are things that are probably so, like we know that there's sensitive periods, but we can't really name them all. Uh, we know that there might, be, uh, there might be a critical period for your first language and gross motor skills in the first few years of life, but we can't really prove it, right? Then there's intelligent speculation. Okay, boys and girls, men and women, they look different from the outside, so they must be different on the inside, too. That's intelligent speculation, but there's... No evidence behind There's very little evidence behind it, or it's of mixed quality. And then there's just the stuff that are just wrong. It's wrong. It's nervous. It's lies about the brain, okay? Overgeneralizations about the brain. So what I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you to um, do what I did with an Adelphi panel, which is a panel of experts, including people like Michael Posner and Howard Gardner and and John Brewer and a bunch of the big top guys in education, psychology, and, uh, and neuroscience, and I asked them, to read the many concepts that teachers are exposed to, like um, you know, water is vital for learning. Kids should drink you know, eight glasses of water while they're in school or something like that. I had them read these statements and separate whether or not they're well-established, probably so, intelligent speculation or neural myths. And unfortunately, most of the things that teachers read are mythical. They are not real. They do not have scientific backing in them. So what we want to do is to look at these and have a little quick quiz here. And all I want you to do is to tell me which of these four categories you think the information falls into. Is it well established? Probably so, which means that probably so would mean it's true, but there's huge human variance. Um, or is it just speculation or is it a myth? Okay, and then I want you to also reflect on this. How does that really change your teaching? Human brains are as unique as human faces. What do you think? True, false, lots of evidence, myth, what do you think? One, what does one mean? <laughs> that it's a myth or that it's true? 
True, 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 true. Tracy, it's definitely true. Tracy, we all have would similar you like to, hearts, uh, right? To do it with the yes. check mark so uh -huh. we can see who says yes and who says no altogether. Okay. With the next one. We'll okay. Start. Okay. Uh, sure. I'll explain that then. Okay, great. Okay. Great. So we know that human brains are as you can unique as human faces. This means that we all have the same parts, right? You have two eyes, I have two eyes, two ears, two ears, two nose. But we don't have the same looking faces, right? So we know that brains have the same parts. You have similar lobes. You have frontal lobes, you have occipital lobes, you have hemispheres. Those parts are the same, but there are no two brains that are exactly identical. Why? What changes the brain? What makes even identical twins? Why are their brains different? What makes their brains different? What makes your brain different? Is that a question nope. we're being asked? It's not a hormone. It's not hormones. Not what you study necessarily. Epigenetic. What else? What else? Give me an easy daily word. Not your genes. <laughs> what would make two, two identical twins' brains? When they are born, their brains are actually different because of the experiences they have. Okay? Their different experiences will change the way that their different parts of the brain are connected and potentially can be connected in the future, okay? Now, this has a huge impact on whether or not we decide, if you know that there's no two brains that are identical in your classroom and that all of this hinges on past experience, do we know enough about our students? Uh, do we know how to differentiate? Do we know this, uh, this concept of universal design for learning where we hit a common denominator but we're trying to let every child maximize his own potential in our classroom? Um, we're not going to have time to talk about the flipped classroom, but there's this idea that if you create the space with the resources so that people can rehearse the things that they don't know, so that when they come to the class, more people will be at the same level for starting, there's a way around this, okay? Number two, all brains are equally prepared for all tasks. Can you please vote? Where is Just that, Jane? Under a, where it says participants, there is a check that you can either check green or a, or do the red X. Say yes would be checking the green, and X would be checking the, uh, the three people have already voted. Please, some more of you checks, either click the green check or the red X, and then we'll see what's happening. Four of you have voted. A few more, maybe. Okay, so we have a good, good number of people who say brains are not all equal for all things. And this has to do with all of you who are listening when we talked at the very beginning. <laughs> we talked, you're not, not everybody is born uh, ready to do the same things. Basically, you inherit a set of genes, and different people are born with different abilities based on the, uh, the, the potential to, um, to maximize uh, the use of what you're born with. But not everybody is born, you know, you're not born on an equal playing field. And here is where you do have big differences with kids who are undernourished. Mothers who are poorly nourished uh, during pregnancy or children who are not given basic stimulation in the early years. The brain architecture is just not ready to, to, to go. Barring those types of things, um, you are still not born equally because of the genes that you inherit. So you get some big ones from your mom and dad, and that's, you know, that's your starting point. But if you know that not all people are going to be ready to do all things at the same moment, for example, we know that some kids are ready to learn to read when they're three, and some people are ready to learn to read when they're seven. And that's okay, because if you test those people when they're nine, there's no difference in the level of their reading. So we know there's, people are different, you know, they're ready at different times. And we have a hard problem now with these testing requirements that are forcing everybody into sort of a, a package deal, everybody has to respond at the same time at the same age. And we know that's just not something that's, that's actually fair or realistic. Next one, past information influences how we learn something new. Can you quickly vote? True or false? Yes, you agree with that or no, you don't agree with it? Yes, 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 very good. Definitely, all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience. Why? Because your brain is incredibly efficient and wants to know to relate something new to something that it could know, something new, all right? So it always looks for patterns. What do I already know about this? Or it looks for things that would be um, novelty, something that's different than, than what I already know. So we know that this is absolutely true. But if you're in a classroom, how do you, 
how do you take uh, most advantage of that? You can only do that if you know your students. And this gets back to, I think, it's Iris's comment. If you have 40 kids in your class, how do, can you really know what they already know and if you're at a good starting point with them? Well, there are several technique, techniques that you can use to do that and gather information. Um, and I'd love to, if, if uh, large classes are a problem and you want to write me, I'd love to give you some very specific things you can do. One thing is what we're doing here, um, a one minute paper. So you gather in the information, see so what is my starting point with this group and where should I take it. The brain changes constantly with experience. True, false, maybe, yes, no. Good, yes, 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 absolutely. Hopefully you guys are going to go to bed tonight with a different brain from the one you woke up with this morning <laughs> if you learned anything <laughs> through this context. Uh, the very interesting thing, however, is that the brain, um, the connections at a microscopic level actually occur before behavioral changes. Um, this is true if any of you have ever taught a small child to read. You know, you can spend weeks or months, you know, practicing reading out loud, doing things, and then in one day, that kid seems to read. Um, it's not that he learned to read in that second. It's that he was slowly priming all of the networks that are necessary to be ready so that he could then learn to read. So we know that this is absolutely true. But you actually, you know, you have to take advantage of this by being more patient. You have to know that not everybody has all of the same prior experiences, and they'll need to build that up before they can actually learn new things. This goes to Galit's question. The brain is highly plastic or flexible? What do you think? Yes, no? Yes, 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 yes. Very good. <clears throat> There's a high degree of plasticity, and this, um, this goes throughout the lifespan, uh, as we mentioned before. And it's not just in the extreme cases of, um, of damage. We know that some people who have suffered stroke, for example, can then learn to speak, and so they learn how to reconnect. Um, Paul Bhakti Rita did experiments with congenitally blind people, people born blind. And you learn about your world through your senses, uh, through your five senses, right? You learn about your world. Well, if one of your senses, like your, your seeing, your, is, is, your sight is gone, then he said, why don't we use the other senses to teach? So he taught these blind people to see um, through pulses on their tongue. They said it was kind of like learning a foreign language. So the brain was naturally looking for a network to be formed in one way, but that way was damaged. So what do we do? We look for another way to get the same information to bring through different sensory tracks. So these are just the five things. Remember I showed you there's only five things that are true for all brains, independent of culture, independent of the age. Those five things are true for all brains. That makes us question, what about the rest of the information? Um, what do you think about this one? Do you need attention and memory for learning? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. Most of this comes with a, a confusion. Um, let me ask a prior question. Is your brain always paying attention? Yes, it is. It just not, might not be paying attention to what you want it to be paying attention to as a teacher, right? This is too simplistic of a, of a, of a formula, but say, you know, Keep in mind, this is definitely true. If you don't have memory of something, you can't learn it, which is why I tell my students, always take notes. Even if you don't think it means anything, this will trigger a memory for you. You need to, to memorize in order to learn. But you also have to be paying attention to learn. And if you're not, if you're missing attention or you're missing memory, there is no learning, okay? So based on that kind of information, those are maybe five and a half real truths. Um, and you can learn to be a great teacher just based on those five things. But then there's some other things that we think teachers should know about the brain as well. Remember we talked about sleep very briefly, do you remember? We said that sleep is important for learning, right? Does anybody remember why it's important for learning? We said that sleep is different than dreaming, right? This comes from Robert Stickle's work at Harvard that shows that your brain, when you're sleeping, you can get your energy up so now you can pay attention. But when you're dreaming, there's a unique combination of neurotransmitters at that moment that allow memory consolidation. And you can actually test this in class. If you've ever had a student who comes and said, oh, they stayed up all night and, and they, they studied for your test, and they take the test and they do okay. But if you ask them the exact same question 24 hours later, they don't remember a thing because they did not 
dream. They did not consolidate that memory into long-term memory. It was just there in a form of working memory for the, the short term, right? So if you really want people to learn, you have to allow them a good night's rest. Um, okay. Next one, making decisions, and this was connected with a question that came up, with a cool head, okay, without emotions. That helps you think better and make better decisions, true or false. It might sound wonderful in an ideal world. However, physiologically speaking, it's impossible. <laughs> Why? Because remember we said all the learning passes through, um, through your senses, right? What does it do? It travels up the, your, your, I don't know if I can draw this. Am I drawing right? Yes. It travels up your spinal cord, and the very first stop it makes, it double checks with the, the amygdalas and it says, hi, is this something that I should be afraid of or run away from? And in less than a split second, it goes frontal lobe and then back to the hippocampus for confirmation. But physiologically speaking, everything that we sense will first go through an, emo uh, an emotional uh, memory filter. What do I remember of this? Is it dangerous, right? And then the second thing will be a real confirmation with the hippocampus. So we know that it's impossible uh, to make decisions uh, without emotions, but we also know that they're actually complementary processes and very beneficial. Um, but teachers tend to only go cognitive and they, don't, they forget that they are actually having an emotional uh, reaction from their students in the way they teach, the way they look at the students, how they interact with them, how much encouragement, whether or not they scream or yell, or if they, they discipline, the, discipline them in a nicer way, or if they give feedback or don't. All of those things are emotional, um, emotional influences on cognitive learning, okay? This means that we have to be designing better classroom environments, you know, that keep kids stimulated enough but not freaked out, you know, that they're so anxious because we know that high anxiety students also have this level of hormones that prevents the neural connections that are necessary for new learning. So we have to manage the emotional aspect of learning in a much better way than we, we have been in the past. For example, People judge each other's faces and tones of voices immediately and almost unconsciously. Is that true? We judge each other's faces and tones of voices almost immediately and unconsciously. Do you agree with that? Yes, 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 yes. Most of us do. It is definitely unconscious and it is definitely something even if we don't even if the teacher doesn't mean to transmit something, that doesn't matter. What matters is what the student perceives. I've had students come to me, you know, whining and crying and like, oh, the teacher hates me. It's like, I don't think the teacher hates you. It's like, hello, Eduardo, do you hate her? And he goes, no, no. In fact, I told her she was doing really well. But what did he say? He said, you're doing just fine. Now, in doing it in that way, his tone of voice and his facial expression sends a different message from the words. So actually, your facial expression and your tone of voice actually are carrying different and more powerful messages than even the real words you say. So do we help teachers manage their body language? Do they know how to recognize these, you know, seven basic emotions on kids' faces? Do we know how to manage our own facial expressions? These are things that we really need to be taking into consideration in new teacher training, okay? Um, do um, Iris says, do you detach emotion and senses from behavior? Absolutely not. There's an integrated process there. Your behavior is based on your emotional reaction to different things. But it's cyclical. Um, for example, Iris, are you happy because you smile or do you smile because you're happy? Both. <laughs> Both things are true, okay? So we know that there's a reciprocal process here. The way we express something and the way we uh, process an emotion, and, and, and be clear on this, emotions are different from feelings. Emotion is a physiological change. You know, the hormones, this is a different, uh, this is a physiological change. Feeling, what you feel, is your interpretation of that emotion, okay? So one psychological, one is neurophysiological, okay? Um, humans seek out novelty as well as patterns, absolutely and always, okay? It is a human instinct to look for what is slightly different. But you can take this to your advantage when you teach. You can tell a kid, okay, you know what 2 plus 3 is, that equals 5. What do you think 5 minus 3 is equals 2? So they can see what is different, but then they also, your brain is forced to look for novelty as well as patterns. It tries to see what it already knows about something so that it can conserve and economize learning by actually extending that based on what it already knows in the past. What about nutrition? Does nutrition influence learning? 
Yes. But not all calories are created alike. We know that your brain uses about 20% of your calorie con uh, consumption. That means the perfect diet is just, you know, think. <laughs> that will help you lose weight. But the, we know that there's no perfect diet um, related to the brain. Um, but we know that your brain is like another important organ in your body. What's another important organ that you have in your body? Your heart, right? So a good diet, a good rule of thumb is basically what's good for your heart is good for your brain, okay? Do, uh, going back to the emotional thing, stress impacts learning, true or false? What do you guys think of that? Stress impacts learning? We have one person, two person, three, three, four, or five, everybody says yes. Stress definitely impacts learning. But is stress always bad? No. There's such a thing as good stress. This helps us be alert and focused and paying attention, right? Um, but too much bad stress definitely influences learning because we mentioned before, uh, different emotions release different types of hormones or vice versa. Different hormones cause us to feel uh, differently about things, right? In a high stress environment, high anxiety environment, we'll have higher levels of neurotransmitters that block others so it does not permit the new connections for learning. So a highly stressed kid is not going to learn, okay? So it's good to keep them on their toes, but not make them panicked, because once they're panicked, they will not be able to learn, okay? Uh, oh, we've gone back to this. We lost the myth. We lost the myth. Okay, yeah. let's Let take a take minute while, well, um, Jay, can okay. you put up the... I'm going to take care of that. Okay. okay. And while we're doing this... Uh, we have no, 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 yes, totally. Okay, so we know that emotions impact learning. No, 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 hold on a moment. Are we on to the next I'm one? I'm going to take care of that now. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm Just leave it there for one I'm moment and we'll be ready. Okay. okay. Okay, so as you, many of you are uh, acknowledging, there's a huge connection between uh, affective states, emotional states, and cognitive achievement, okay? So that's a hope, hopefully a very big takeaway that you'll be able to, to apply in your classroom. And this has to do with the way we relate to our students. Remember the very first point we talked about is being able to, um, you know, make sure that students believe at a minimum. They don't have to love us, but they should think that we believe in their ability to learn. That is at a minimum um, in order for the, to, to lay the groundwork for a student to be able to learn. Okay, now we're going to get into the very last section here. Uh, humans use only about 10% of your brains. Have you guys heard of that one? Is this an answer? I'm going to clear this because it says that there's seven people who think that's true. Oh, no, people are changing their answers. Okay, okay. Humans use only 10% of their brain. Half of you think that that's true? I hope not. Okay. <laughs> This is total uh, false. This is very Pardon false. Me. This uh, Tracy, Tracy, yes? we came here to learn. If we knew all of this before, then why would we come? <laughs> well, this came from, and this is, a, it makes sense, because before we used to have such poor technology that we thought um, that we would take pictures of, we would tell somebody, um, think of all, name all animals that you can think of that start with the letter D. And then we take this, you know, image of the brain, and then we say, look, you know, less than 10% is being illuminated, right? And we have this generalization come up that, yes, humans are using very little of their brain, and it could very well be that was 100% of what your brain needs to name animals with the letter D, right? So now that we have better technology, we know that that's absolutely untrue. How about this one? Some people are more right-brained, and others are more left-brained. What do you think of that? There are right-brained people and left-brained people. Somebody says yes. Some people are more right brain than left brain. The person, who, the people who said that this is true, I'd like you to look at the source of that information. Um, this is a really catchy and sexy way to sell brain literature to teachers. You know, they say teaching to the right brain or to the um, unattended right brain learners or something like that. And that, you know, unfortunately, we're not teaching to this, you know, wacko crazy group over here in the right brain, and we're only doing you know, uh, lined up teaching and, and on the left brain. This is just not true. There's absolutely nothing that you do that is isolated to a single hemisphere. And by the way, you only have one brain, so you can't have a right brain and a left brain, right? You have one brain, and they're intricately connected through different networks. Before, it was fashionable, even 20 years ago, to say that, you know, language is definitely in a left uh, hemisphere because we found that Broca and Wernicke's area in most people was there. However, when you look at um, when humans think about um, humor or metaphors, 
huge, you know, right frontal lobe connections there. So um, there's a whole lot uh, more to to um, to things that we can now see with better technology. So this is definitely false. There's no such thing as right brain and left brain learners. Please, please get away from that kind of literature. Um, okay. Students can pay attention for uh, for 90 minutes or an hour and a half. <laughs> Let's see if anybody answers this question. This will tell us if it's going to be turned up. Most people can only pay attention for about, you know, 10 to 20 minutes. However, what teachers don't realize is that they can extend, they're in charge of changing the person, you know, who's the focus, the place, the physical place, or the activity. And you can change those things every couple of minutes so you can keep up the attention span. What we try to do here is that every 10, uh, 15 to 20 minutes we try to get you to stop and vote on something or write something so that we change the person, right, so that you can maintain attention for the for the length of time we have here, which is why at the beginning, and this is primacy recency, humans remember best what happens first, second best what happens last, and then the stuff in the middle might get lost, right? So what did we try to do is that we framed this lesson by saying, you know, education has changed. We need to nurture our, our craft with things from neuroscience. And then we're ending with things about myths so that you can keep that in mind because that was the main focus of this particular talk. This means in practice, all this middle time has to be spent on students actually doing or applying the information or reflecting on it uh, in a meaningful way so that you can actually use your time with the students in the best way possible, okay? So much of what we hold to be truths does not have scientific foundation. And I'm only going to highlight a few of them in order to, um, if for those of you who find the things that I read out loud, if I read something and you totally disagree and you say, wait, I need clarification. I've, always, I've lived by that. That can't be a myth. Please write it in the chat box or turn on your mic because we need to hear from you. Some of the neuro myths that exist, that mental capacity is hereditary and cannot be changed by the environment or experience. False. Intelligence is fixed. You can't change the brain. False. Most people use 10% of their brains. False. The left and right hemispheres are isolated. False. Your brain acts like a video camera and we store and make a memory of everything that we experience and see. False. Your brain will shrink if you don't drink six to eight glasses of water a day. False. By the way, these things come from popular press literature that is bought by, by teachers in high quantities based on the volume of books sold in on Amazon, okay? Alcohol kills brain cells, drug use makes holes in your brain, not true. Brain, yes, yes, to a certain extent, yes, it kills some brain cells, but it's not like you're going to be, it's the death of you if you drink a glass of wine. It's, it has to do with proportion, like Socrates says, everything in moderation. Brain parts work in isolation, false. Individuals learn better when they receive information in the preferred learning style. There is no such thing as learning styles. Investment in this is a waste of money. All people learn through all of their senses all of the time. You might have a cognitive preference for something. Most people say that they visualize things better than, than other modes. But you cannot turn off one of your senses. You are always using all of your senses when you learn. The theory of multiple intelligences is validated by neuroscientific research, false. And Howard Gardner has said this himself in, in my Delphi panel. Uh, forget the music, the arts, the ease, spend more time studying. Mm -hmm. Wrong mm -hmm. idea, bad mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. Use if lots I of the same may, kind of math there problems. was a yes. teacher uh -huh. strike in Oregon yes. just ended about a month ago. And uh, the teachers demanded, among other things, that there would be time for recess, which I think is one of the greatest things that we've of, with everything that's happening in the States, that was one of the, and they just, they got it. Recess, recess was, was returned to elementary schools. Wonderful. And this has to do with our, our working environments. If you guys just saw, um, Sweden has decided to go to a six-hour work week, right, right? The idea is that you need downtime. You need time distant from just cognitive behavior in order to process and decide what you really know and don't know. You said a okay? six-hour work week. Uh, I think you test. said a six-hour work week. But I think you made a six-hour work day. Oh, six-hour work day. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, right, you're right. Work that, that would be really good. <laughs> that would be fabulous. <laughs> um, High-stage testing are an accurate measure of what a student knows and their intelligence. Wrong. Humans are born a blank slate. This is what we thought in the 1800s. Um, all we have to do is fill up their empty vessels. That's not true. 
Everything important about the brain is determined by the age of three. This is false. I'd like you to read John Bruner's book about the myth of, of three years of age. Violent video games have no effect on behavior. They do have an effect on behavior. Using the internet makes you smarter or makes you dumber. It's a tool. You know, it's how you use it. It's not what it is, okay? Environments rich in stimuli provide the brain, uh, improve the brains of preschool children. Problem is the definition of what is rich in stimuli. What's rich to one kid is not rich to another. Vaccines cause autism, false. Learning is independent of a learner's history, false. Learning problems associated with developmental differences in brain functions cannot be remedied by education. Not true. You, there are many things that we can do in um, formal education settings to rem uh, remediate problems that a kid might be born with. Individuals are not responsible for behavior associated with developmental differences, uh, different functions in the brain. That means it's a, you know, oh, well, I'm born with it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm born to be a mass killer, there's nothing I can do about it. That's not true either. <laughs> Teens are irresponsible and act out because the prefrontal cortex doesn't uh, develop until the 20s. That's a hot topic if you want to get into it. The next one is people can multitask. There's no such thing as multitasking. If we do brain scans, when somebody tries to divide their attention, you can actually see it is literally divided. Um, what people can look like they're able to do many things at the same time, it's because they maintain things in working memory, but it's not that they're actually paying attention at the same level. When your brain sleeps, you shut down. Wrong, as we saw, it's vital to learning. People who are brain dead are still unconscious, not true. The brain is plastic for certain kinds of information only during specific critical periods. We no longer talk about critical periods in formal education settings. There may, may be a critical period for your first language and for gross motor skills in the early years. Those are the only two things. There's no critical period for learning foreign language. There's no critical period for learning how to do art, math, history, OK? Um, and then let me see. Da -da, I'm going to jump because we have very few minutes left, and I just want to expose you to a bunch of these different things. Um, I experienced the, the brain remembers everything it's ever experienced. Forgetting is simply an absence of recall. There's a huge area of study which has to do with forgetting, not just memory, not just how we put it in, but your ability to retrieve is actually um, influenced more by why we forget than why we remember, and that's something that should be looked into more. Uh, the range of the spirit is a special sense, and I'm going to skip this. Uh, social. Learning can be isolated from the social and emotional context. Absolutely not. All learning is in, uh, an individual learns based on their entire context, uh, based on the mom and dad fighting at home, um, the, the violence that they might find in the street, based on what they ate for breakfast. So learning in your classroom is highly influenced by many things you have no control over. And you have to be aware of those things, and you have to leverage your own teaching in the best way possible. Um, there's many myths about bilingualism, which is a favorite area of mine, if you'd like to talk about it. There's myths about gender and race. Um, and there's myths related to commercial ventures. Uh, Neuro-linguistic programming, brain gym, if they've made it uh, to your country, please kick them out. Um, there's, no, there's no evidence for those things either. I'd like to end with this one and a half minutes that we have left. <laughs> Um, to actually try to make this a bit more concrete, and then if we, those of you who feel like staying for more questions, I'm, I will stay as long as you want to. But in order to have a takeaway, there's been a lot of information, and this will serve you, you know, maybe it was interesting or fun, or you were listening to me in the background while you did other things, but if it's really meant to do something to improve your practice as teachers, you have to take the time to reflect a teeny bit which means downtime. This is kind of like the white space you have on a, in a magazine. You need to have something that lets your eye rest. We, we need now to just look back. All the things you might have jotted down or ideas that are floating in your head, please give me, write down for yourself. What are three things that you learned today that you didn't know before? Two things that are so interesting that you're going to actually research them more or talk to somebody else about them. And one thing you will actually do to change your practice to improve your practice as a teacher. If you're all able to do that, then I think that this has been a successful encounter. If there's anybody who says, oh, no, I knew all of that, then I'm sorry. We need to get you into the advanced class, and we can, we can go into greater depth in this information. Um, but please take the time to, to really think, what is it that you're going to take away from this that will actually improve the way you teach? Um, as a general invitation, again, um, I told you there's an optional homework that we're going to be assigning to you. So is this up here already, Jay? The homework isn't there. We, it's too big for me to get in there. 
But, okay. Uh, okay. So the homework is, I'll, I'll describe it to you. Everyone okay. who is registered will be receiving a link both to the recording and to this presentation and to the homework presentation. So, uh, and so what, mm -hmm. you'll be able to download that. And you guys can choose to do this or not, but it has to do with those really de dedicated teachers who say, yes, I want to, I want to do something different and I want to do something better. Uh, the homework is, um, is an extended uh, uh, explanation in far more detail of 50 different interventions that have been proven to, uh, to uh, they improve student learning outcomes with an explanation of the neuro and the psychological elements behind it. Why does um, Socratic questioning, for example, work in a classroom? Why does space versus mass practice improve learning? So there's explanations of, of 50 different things that you could actually do in your classroom. And what you're invited to do is to identify one, two, two of those things you'd like to try in your own classrooms this year, and I'm very happy to accompany you on that. Um, if you say, listen, I've decided I'm going to apply this, I teach adults, um, and this is my challenge with it, I will be happy to accompany you in that change that you'd like to apply uh, in your classroom settings. But I do ask that you look at the, the videos first, um, which will be, the link will be sent to you so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page with this, okay? Okay, so we have, uh, we have uh, just a, Three minutes left on my clock. I'm not sure how much time we have here, but I do want to go back now to the um, to the uh, to the boards to see some specific questions, uh, especially on this three to one thing. What we try to do is to look over our new discoveries, thanks to technology that we have about the brain and their influence on learning. I ask you to imagine changing your approach, not just from what we do in pedagogy and what we've always done, but can you incorporate some new information about the brain and learning? We looked at some of the things that influence successful practice, and then I asked you at the very end here to think about, did something come up that we talked about, either about uh, the influence of prior learning or about emotions or about memory or attention or things about special needs, something that was different that was important to you and things that you want to continue looking into and then things that you might be able to apply to change your practice, okay? So anybody brave who wants to share something or to lay something out? I have a, who wrote no? Like, you got nothing out of it? No, I hope I'm looking at the wrong time. <laughs> you were, you were. And the microphone is open, so if someone wants to take a microphone, it's possible. Okay, I see, I see that uh, Le, Leo, Madaim has said that uh, as a question about is there a predominancy of certain hemispheres in certain people. There is not. I mean, self, uh, save the people that have only one hemisphere, and there are some people, you know, we had actually in our university a kid who had had um, half of his, uh, his brain removed, one of his hemispheres removed early in age, um, and they don't see. They can't see very well because that part is missing um, in, in one side, so they can't see in one half of their brain, but it's not that individuals are more dominant right hemisphere or left hemisphere. In fact, if you'd like a good example of that, please go on to the Connectum Project, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, I'll write it here. The Connectum Project is actually showing, um, it shows human brains um, that are doing different things, and you'll find that there's not one thing, nothing, that you can ask a brain to do that only uses one hemisphere or that somebody is dominant. Uh, for one hemisphere or another. Um, and if you're asking this question, it's because you believe that there's isolated abilities in those hemispheres, like we're more creative if we're right hemisphere. That is also not shown to be true. There's at least 33 different definitions of creativity. And when you look at the, the neuroscience behind people being creative in those ways, they're using all kinds of cross-references between the hemispheres. It's never just one thing, okay? Um, does somebody, so left, left-handed people makes no difference. Um, 95 percent of right-handed people and 70 percent of left-handed people do tend to have this one thing. This is Broca and Wernicke's area in the left uh, frontal and parietal cortex. However, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Left-handed people aren't necessarily, um, you know, uh, automatically more creative or better with foreign languages. So that's, that's sort of out there. So, okay. Um, oh, thank you, Jay. That's very helpful. Okay. So, other questions that are up there. Continuous visual attention. Um, 
JJ. Is there any other question that's coming up now? Anything that you'd like? I, uh, one thing I will do, pay more attention to the middle of the class and give my students more time for reflection. I think that is an excellent uh, promise. I think that we have, um, we have very little time in our classrooms and we feel very pressured to fill every second with content, content, content. But um, if you'll look on the videos that, that you have for optional homework, there's a whole section on activities related to reflection. Um, taking, you know, a bit of downtime, uh, assessing, doing self-assessments. Um, for example, a very successful thing that they've implemented in the International Baccalaureate in math class is that kids keep a journal. They actually, at the end of class, write what do they feel, what worked for them, what was the stress, you know. Just by getting that out on paper and not letting it bang around in their heads, they found that students uh, develop a better sense of metacognition, what, what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So taking the time you know, to breathe a little and to think, what did I really get out of this, is very helpful in consolidating um, new learning, OK? Um, so thank you for that. Anybody else? One, do you know any specific tests for learning styles for applying with students? I will tell you, do not do learning styles, please. <laughs> I will send you an article by Pashler, in which they were charged by the um, National Science Foundation to see if there was evidence uh, for learning styles. And they did a huge literature review of everything that has ever been done on learning styles um, and came to the conclusion that it's a waste of money. Um, don't try to box people into this idea that they're kinesthetic or they're visual or they're auditory learners. There's a lot better ways to use your time and your money to do that. Having said that, um, in vocational education, we use a lot of tools that help kids identify their strengths. What am I really good at and what do I love in order to do what? To align their passion with their talents. And, and that's a positive thing. I think that you know, identifying your strengths is a really good thing. Boxing kids into a hole and telling them that, you know, oh, you're, you're obviously an auditory learner and I'm a visual learner, which is why we didn't connect or why you didn't learn as much in my classroom or, or this activity is only for, you know, kinesthetic learners or whatever, that's really out the window. That is definitely something that I would highly discourage you to get away from, okay? Uh, not good. Don't go there. Don't go there, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, Dell's kind of experience is not true. It doesn't exist. In fact, they tried to go back and try to figure out who, who actually did, where was the original research. Um, and people can trace it back more or less to about 1969 is the first publication. But nobody can find a real study. So there is a group of researchers, um, I think it's in Chicago and in Harvard, are, who are actually trying to repeat this to see if this makes any sense. For those of you who want to, to understand this better, there's this cone that says that people who actually, um, if all you do is listen or just, you know, one single mode of learning, you're going to retain like 5%. And if you see a visual, like a PowerPoint, you might get 5 to 15% more. And if you had some supplementary reading or follow-up homework afterwards, you might get a little bit higher. But the true learning comes into play when you're actually, you are asked to give an example or to teach another. Um, and those things, nobody disagrees with. Those things definitely are right. What they disagreed with is this is 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. They don't agree with that because it's just too neat and it's, it doesn't seem to be right. This goes to the idea that the more, what is true, and not learning styles, but what is true is that the more ways you learn a similar concept, the more distinct modes of learning that are used, the higher the probability that you'll be able to recall it later. This is what Howard Gardner says is why his great contribution, you know. He's encouraged teachers to teach the same concept in multimodal ways, in different ways. So if you have the same idea of, for example, if I tell you that the number three, if you write the number three or you write the word three or you write three dots, those are stored in three different neural networks in your brain. So, so your concept of three is embellished each time you have a new way of thinking of that concept. So the idea is that more ways you put things in, the greater probability of recall. So we know memory is important for learning, so that's why you should be encouraged to do things in many different ways. Not just reading about it, not just you know doing it, but multiple ways of doing it will increase the way that you can retrieve information, okay? Um, 
Thank you, Sebastian. Ya hablamos más tarde. Okay, so what I, I will leave you then with all of you with this last idea of, I can't remember, it's not even here. I'll put it on the very first slide. For those of you who are interested or do or would like to have um, any kind of a, a, a follow-up, I'm very, very happy. Oh, it's gone now. It's already gone. I'll put it down in the lower part. If you'd like to send me an email, it's just my name at Gmail. I'm very happy to support you in exploring some of these concepts um, further. So if you do have questions or things that you'd like to talk about, I don't think the email is there. But anyways, it's there, um, it's there for any kind of follow-up that you'd like to have. And um, I thank you guys for taking the time to be in the session to stick it out. And I apologize. If you ever met me in person, you know I don't always talk this much. I much prefer a dynamic exchange. And I know we're limited in, our, in the ways we could do that today. But um, I hope that it was uh, worth your while. Tracy, thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. I have to admit, I also uh, have a tendency to speak quickly. And you have outclassed me totally. And I, 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 I'm coming at for, I'm coming <laughs> oh, no. up for breath. So it, it must be exhausting for you. Seriously, thank you very, very much. I think that all of us were very, very pleased. I'm, uh, I have checked the applause icon. If you guys don't know where it is, no problem. Um, we filled up this time very, very quickly. Uh, thank you for sharing. I understand that not, if you want to say something, you can take the, uh, the microphone if you want, Shoshana. But we're looking forward to, uh, to closing down finally because, well, frankly, we're exhausted. <laughs> and uh, as I said, everyone, everyone will be receiving a, a link to both the recording, to a PDF, both of the presentation and of the um, uh, and of the homework that we received. And in that way, all of us will be able to uh, um, to follow through. And in the PDF is Tracy's uh, email, so it's not a problem to reach her. She uh, seems to be more than happy to uh, to engage all of us with uh, uh, with uh, what we've learned today. I have to admit, I've encountered many of the myths from teachers and even from teacher educators. And so I'm more than happy to have the opportunity to have someone with a doctorate in front of their name telling us that this is not the way it is. Sadly, there are people who do have that in front of their name who think it is the way it is, but we're not going to get into that at the moment. I'm going to say that this was very, very informative, very useful. Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, there are more. This was our first um, webinar uh, in English this year. The next one will actually be in Spanish. And the one after that in December will be about the use of Wikipedia in education. Um, it'll be uh, conducted by the head of Wikimedia in Israel in English. And we will be having more. So please, we have your addresses. I won't go into all of these. Just to let you know that we're happy that you were here. Some of you already got date 30 and said, oh, I don't have the strength for this anymore. But very seriously, Tracy, this was a wonderful uh, presentation. We're very, very pleased that you did this. And uh, we're looking forward to more from all of us. So thank, thank you, you to much. all of you. No, really, thank you. And um, I'm closing the recording. OK.